LegalizeFreedom.com Why are we here? Where do we come from? Where are we going? From the nature of reality to the future of humanity. Beyond politics, poverty and war. LegalizeFreedom.com Greetings and welcome once again to LegalizeFreedom.com. I'm your host, Greg Moffat, and my guest today is Frank Joseph, who joins us to discuss his book, Military Encounters with Extraterrestrials, The Real War of the Worlds. Although close encounters with alien spacecraft are reported as far back as ancient Egypt, it wasn't until the 20th century that UFO sightings and extraterrestrial encounters were truly documented due to advances in technology, as well as the vast increase in incidents, particularly with military forces. Revealing his extensive research, Frank Joseph presents a comprehensive history of armed confrontations between humans and extraterrestrials in the 20th and 21st centuries. He explains how, with the development of atomic bombs and ballistic missiles, the frequency of extraterrestrial intervention in human affairs increased dramatically. He documents incidents both famous and little known, including Foo Fighter sightings and battles with Allied and Axis combatants during World War II, and eyewitness reports from encounters during wars in Korea, Vietnam, Iraq, and the ongoing hostilities in the Middle East. He examines evidence for the shoot-down of flying saucers at Roswell and other locations, alien sabotage of nuclear weapons, and in-flight abductions of both human crew and aircraft. He explores the evidence for the Battle of Los Angeles, which occurred three months after Pearl Harbor, and the details of Operation High Jump, the US Navy's alleged defeat in Antarctica by ET forces 17 months after the atomic bomb was dropped on Nagasaki, while also uncovering evidence of secret Antarctic German bases. The author then examines recent examples of alien interdiction in earthly affairs, such as the meltdown of the Fukushima nuclear plant in Japan, and the fiery abort of Elon Musk's Falcon 9 missile launch. Finally, we consider the issue of disclosure and ask if hard evidence of Earth visitations by extraterrestrial life really exists, will it ever be admitted by those who hold its secrets? Hello and welcome, Frank, and thank you so much for joining us once again on LegalizeFreedom.com. Well, thank you very much, Greg. It's a great pleasure to be back again. Okay, today, Frank, we're going to be talking about one of your latest books. Uh, you've had two published very recently. Uh, the one we're going to be talking about is Military Encounters with Extraterrestrials, The Real War of the Worlds. Uh, before we dive into that, just give listeners a little brief uh, bit of information about your work in general and in your background in writing and publishing. Well, uh, my background has been uh, primarily in history, um, especially uh, American archaeology, and uh, going into uh, extraterrestrial encounters is a little bit far afield, but uh, not as much as it may seem, because uh, I'm applying uh, the same uh, historical criteria that I use for studying and writing about World War I or World War II, as I did with what I feel is uh, the silent war, uh, which is uh, an ongoing uh, struggle. It's been lasting for a little over 100 years now. And uh, I apply those same basic criteria, as I say, to this uh, uh, more uh, uh, unconventional uh, study. Yeah, it's, just, it's not your usual line of investigation, is it? You, you actually have mentioned that in the book. Yes, um, but I feel that it's uh, something that really needs to be discussed. I approached it uh, from a historical point of view, and um, as, a, as I wrote the book, I um, was conscious of uh, my obligation to uh, not to put in too much speculation, as little as possible, to keep the theories down to an absolute minimum and to concentrate uh, almost exclusively 
um, the uh, uh, material, the documented material that I was able to provide in the, the source section of the book at the end. So the book is really an expression, uh, an, an organization, as you as it were, of those source materials that I was able to work with. Just a little note of housekeeping uh, with regard to terminology. Uh, the terms UFO and ET, as in extraterrestrial, these are not uh, mutually interchangeable. Extraterrestrial implies something that is actually of off-world, off-Earth origin. UFO may be ET, but it may also be just what it says it is, unidentified flying object. It could be any form of aircraft or any object in the sky that we just don't happen to know what it is. So it's wor worth bearing in mind the distinction, I think. I think that's, that's important, and uh, I tried to uh, keep that in mind as well while I was writing the book. I uh, don't want to be able to confuse... Um, modern-day secret military equipment or misidentifications with uh, what uh, I'm, I'm striving for, as the title suggests, um, something that's involved with uh, uh, intelligence from another world. Now, as you point out, UFO sightings, would it, would it be they extraterrestrial in origin or otherwise, have been reported at least as far back as ancient Egypt. So there's there's nothing new as far as the interaction with these entities and humankind goes. But for many people, when they think of UFOs or ETs, they, they think back to the Roswell incident and the, you know, the modern era as almost like where it began. I mention this because in many people's minds, ET activity um, or alleged ET activity is bound up with the military in some way. Uh, either involves the military directly or indirectly, and a lot of people who uh, believe there are cover-ups there with uh, the military possibly reverse engineering, extraterrestrial craft, all of that stuff. Uh, however, the catalogue of incidents and, and encounters that you have put together in the book, they kind of open up a whole new world of UFO encounters or ET encounters in many ways because military is kind of inherently secretive. Some of the incidents that you've catalogued are well, relatively well known, particularly within the, the, the UFO community, if I can call it that. Uh, but it is also a different spin on it, a different insight, because a lot of these incidents, you're uh, drawing on reports and testimony from military personnel. And we don't normally get to hear firsthand from people like that, not least of which because of the terms of their, you know, their contracts or whatever, they can't talk about their work. I think that's, that's absolutely correct. And um, the the book, strangely enough, although this was not my original intention, but I think uh, Military Encounters with Extraterrestrials is among uh, the, the best collection of hard documentation and evidence for this phenomena that I've seen anywhere. And the reason why is because military personnel, not only in the United States, but throughout the world, um, have this basic fundamental rule, and that is if you're in the military and you make an official report, uh, you are obligated to tell the truth to the very best of your ability. And if you falsify a report, uh, you're uh, liable under federal legislation to go to jail for a very long time. In the United States, you go to Leavenworth Penitentiary. So these reports that are filed by the military must be factual. They must be truthful. It's not like somebody trying to impress the news media or their friends or something or whatever the motivations might be for some of these sightings. The, this is all the same kind of documentation that if you see uh, an enemy aircraft, you are obliged to tell us. And I found in uh, my research on this phenomena that uh, there are, are basically two types of reaction to military personnel when they see or are involved with a, a UFO or an extraterrestrial, possible extraterrestrial vehicle. That is that they either file the report and they tell it as honestly as they possibly can, even though their careers might be uh, in jeopardy because of that, even though they're doing what they're supposed to do, or else, and this is in the majority of cases, they do not make the report. It's the same thing in police departments. If a policeman will see something that is unusual or possibly illegal or some possible uh, potential uh, threat to his own career, he simply will ignore it. I didn't see it, he'll say. I didn't see whatever it was. And that's the majority of these uh, encounters. But there are brave men and women, mostly men, who uh, 
uh, will, regardless of the possible consequences to their career, will file these reports. And these sometimes these men have suffered in their career, and they have uh, been uh, dismissed under what they call in the United States a Section 8, as someone who has psychological problems and is no longer capable of uh, fulfilling his or her duty. So uh, the, the the sum in total of this this book is amounts to terrific documentation. I do rely on some newspaper reports as well, but for the most part, uh, with some exceptions, some notable exceptions, uh, the newspapers are a, a very credible um, uh, status themselves. So uh, the, the thing that's important, I think, that distinguishes this book from all the thousands of books about UFOs that are out there is that this book says, basically, in effect, that yes, as you mentioned, there have been numerous sightings or encounters of various levels of credibility over thousands of years, going all the way back to ancient Egypt, if not long before, going even back into uh, the Stone Age. There are indications of possible, and and, uh, among the uh, uh, Australian uh, aboriginals, there are indications of possible interactions with ETs. But the difference is that those confrontations, not confrontations, those sightings or encounters, as far as I've been able to determine, have been almost entirely of a friendly or or non-evasive nature until World War I. That makes, that is like a line in the sand historically. Because before 1916, these sightings or encounters seem to have been of a beneficent kind. That changed after 1916. Why is that? What happened during World War I that would change that? Well, World War I was the first of all the many thousands of wars that human beings have been engaged in before, in which human beings finally had the capacity to carry high explosives into the air. You had heavier than aircraft, airplanes, or as they were known in those days, aeroplanes, carrying high explosives to drop on their fellow human beings. Now, if you are in possession of a civilization or a society that has been around perhaps for many thousands of years, unlike our own societies, which rise and fall, rise and fall over time, Let's say you're in possession of a different type of society that's been around for much longer, and your society has evolved into a technologically far superior uh, level of uh, culture, higher culture than ourselves. Then you're able to see, you're able to extrapolate that this society, referring to Western civilization, which is able to have these fragile aircraft dropping high explosives, it's only a matter of time before their technology would evolve to the point where they can develop machines and and, uh, aircraft, rockets, and so forth that can go beyond the Earth and can carry their high, sophisticated weaponry now beyond the Earth into a threatening mode, beyond into the galactic or the solar system neighborhood. And that's, in fact, what did happen in, in the case of only another four or five decades from the biplanes that dropped bombs on each other in World War I to World War II, where you had the V-2, which can, a, a rocket, a ballistic missile that now has the capability of going beyond uh, the lower levels of our atmosphere, and the simultaneous development of nuclear weapons. And it was only a very short time after World War II that those two Weapons were combined, and now we have jumped to the point in the year 2018 where we have now in the United States the United States Space Force and the weaponization of space and the introduction of atomic weapons into outer space, which has actually gone on now for quite some years, really since the end of the last century, where it was covert or secret now it's uh, something that's official. This would certainly alarm um, a highly advanced civilization uh, beyond the Earth because now we are stepping into their backyard. And what my book has done, it has traced the beginnings of this 
developing conflict that began in 1916 and continues on to the present day. Well, you've laid out a timeline there of developments that you say you trace through the 20th century and into the early 21st. We'll rewind and walk through some of those points in more detail. Just before we do that, you mentioned this upsurge of activity during the First World War uh, for the reasons that you cite. And this brings to mind various theories that ET and UFO watchers have had about their purpose, uh, their intent or whatever. And these are various and some of them overlap. And there's the idea that we're sort of some kind of Petri dish sort of experiment that's been monitored and no scientist wants his experiment to blow up or be destroyed prematurely. Uh, There's a sort of caretaker idea that we're, as a species, we're kind of like teenagers, you know, full of energy and aggression and that uh, we need time to mature. So this is, we're being kind of monitored for our own good. And then there's the prison planet hypothesis that we are just a rabid, dangerous, violent species um, who wreak havoc wherever we are allowed to go. So therefore we're being contained. Whatever you think about any of those, the point is that there must be a reason for this, this level of interest, even if on, on the part of another civilization, it was kind of for their own protection in a way. Well, uh, these are, are both are credible uh, hypotheses, but again, we're moving into the uh, theoretical arena, and I've tried my best to uh, avoid that. I just saved a, a little chapter at the end of the book, uh, an afterward, as it were, for uh, my two cents, whatever they were, on the possibilities involved. But for the rest of uh, my investigation, um, although I, I honor and respect these uh, points of view, I really tried to avoid them and to stick with uh, with the facts, as they say. I'm, writing, I'm trying to write a history, uh, not um, a, a thesis necessarily. Um, the reason why is because uh, in 1916, that is the very first time, so far as I've been able to tell, there may have been other incidents that I'm not aware of, but so far as I know, that it was only in 1916, after the war in Europe had been on for already two years, that we had some violence take place, that we had direct attacks take place, and they were not in Europe, they were in the United States. And that makes a terrific amount of sense. Because in 1916, the uh, Western Allies, specifically Britain and France, were losing the war. And the reason they were losing the war is they were running out of the wherewithal to carry it forward. And so especially um, the British military authorities, political authorities, uh, arranged for the United States to become, uh, as uh, was uh, later uh, put on for public consumption, the arsenal of democracy. In other words... Um, the United States, uh, which was uh, until that time officially neutral, was now to become the major arms supplier for uh, France and Britain, especially Britain, in order to continue the war on to a uh, victory. And the major uh, uh, player in this, in the beginning, was uh, the DuPont firms. The DuPont firms were the manufacturers of high explosives, the largest expo- uh, explosive manufacturer on earth. And the DuPont uh, uh, factories began uh, churning out and supplying uh, high explosives uh, for uh, Allied uh, artillery. In 1916, just when this um, uh, arrangement was uh, going forward, a number of DuPont plants were destroyed in the United States. Enormous explosions mostly between the eastern seaboard and the Mississippi Valley, although there were some plants uh, as far afield as the uh, uh, northwest that were also destroyed. Now, at that time, uh, it was considered highly unusual that these plants exploded. Now, we might think today, oh, that was 1916. Uh, These munitions factories didn't have the same kind of security systems in in place that we have today. And so naturally, you expect explosions like this to take place. That is an entirely wrong assumption. The the DuPont firms had been manufacturing high explosives since before the American Civil War, since the 1850s. And between the 1850s and 1916, there had not been a single serious 
uh, uh, incident. That's because the DuPont firms were uh, very meticulous in their procedures to prevent any kind of incident. So, as a matter of fact, between, I think, about 1855 and 1916, uh, there was only one uh, relatively serious incident. It was contained. There was a fire. No one was injured. There was a potential for a serious situation, but it was contained and stopped. Uh, so the DuPonts were uh, very, very uh, um, serious about maintaining their high levels of security, especially when it was obvious that the United States would soon go to war with Imperial Germany. But at the time, in 1916, when these plants began to explode and blow up, and we're talking about not just a few, we're talking about over a dozen major plants destroyed. At that time, 1916, this is from January uh, until uh, late fall, late, uh, uh, rather winter uh, 1916 into uh, early fall 1916, it was thought at that time that these were German agents that were going around blowing up these plants. And, uh, in fact, that helped play into the hands, the, these explosions helped to play into the hands of the, uh, the Hawks uh, in the Congress who were anxious to get the United States into World War I as soon as possible. And the reason why they wanted that was not for patriotic reasons, was because uh, that would uh, get them in their industrial uh, partners, get them an even uh, more profitable situation to completely fund now uh, the British and French uh, in their uh, need to carry on the war. But in fact, there were no German agents in the United States that the Kaiser was doing everything conceivable to keep the United States out of war. He was having hard enough time fighting uh, Tsarist Russia, uh, in, yeah, Royal uh, England and uh, Democratic France. He was already outnumbered. He did not want the United States involved. And the last thing he wanted to do was to uh, antagonize American, uh, the Americans who were already getting geared up for uh, participation anyway. It was found out in congressional investigations immediately after the war, literally in the year 1920, just a little more than a year after the war ended, that there was not one of these incidents involved a German agent or foreign agents of any kind. But what was interesting, and I was able to dig up the original reports, military and newspaper reports about these um, DuPont factories that were exploding. In virtually every case, there were sightings, usually before, many times after the explosions, of what people described as strange airplanes or flying hats, often described as Mexican hats. Now, we have to understand 1916 is a very long time before the Roswell incident or uh, the, the so-called official beginning of uh, sightings in, in, 19, in the late 1940s. Nobody thought of flying saucers. The term was inconceivable. And so these sightings are described as metallic hats or flying hats, sombreros, and strange airplanes, enemy airplanes. Well, the Germans had no aircraft operating uh, over uh, our munitions factories. Now, I must admit that there is, there is no report that shows a direct attack involved between, in other words, like a flash of light or uh, some kind of um, bomb being dropped or ray or whatever. But nonetheless, during these attacks, numerous witnesses and often po uh, police witnesses uh, describe these strange vehicles that would appear suddenly just before or just afterwards. The other interesting point about these sightings is in every case, there was never any sound associated with these flying hats. Now that's, in, or, or strange airplanes. That's interesting in itself because not only is that usually characteristic of modern UFO sightings where these vehicles are silent, but also back in 1916, airplanes were very noisy affairs. And even though you'd have a small aircraft flying at some altitude, you could always hear them. They were very loud. 
And yet these so-called uh, enemy aeroplanes never made any noise. I think I've also found that very curious. And it was only after the uh, destruction of so many of these plants, which became the suppliers, that the military themselves began seeing these craft and actually had confrontation with them. Back in World War One. And the earliest of them occurred at a naval yard, the Portland Naval Yard, when um, four American soldiers opened fire on a luminous craft which made aggressive, aggressive moves towards the plant. They were guarding a bridge, and this bridge was right outside the naval yard. And it was uh, very late at night where this luminous object uh, flew out of the night, made directly for their position, and they opened fire on it, and they all claimed to have uh, hit it because they were it was not very far away when it veered away at high speed at a very uh, strange uh, uh, high angle. Again, there was no noise involved. And it was assumed that it was some kind of a secret German weapon. Of course, the Germans saw nothing like that over here at that time. It was also seen by... Uh, other uh, civilian um, observers at the time, before and after that incident. So uh, we are beginning to get the very first type of aggressive encounters that were not um, really part of the UFO history before the advent of World War One. Anyone who's taken even the slightest interest in the UFO or ET phenomenon is aware of the Roswell incident and a lot of the media coverage around that, uh, members of the public getting involved, the first talk of military cover-ups, of confiscated evidence, of reverse engineering, all of that in people's minds kind of started then. But prior, the period that you're talking about, the First World War and, and interwar, was really when what we consider to be the modern mainstream media was kind of just getting geared up. You know, we think of increase in literacy and the production of newspapers, Edward Bernays and his, his propaganda and right. the dawn of advertising and, you know, radio, which would soon become television. But that given, it was all just getting started. What were military authorities saying about any of this to the media, if, if anything, at that time? Well, that, it's uh, really interesting because this is, was not the era of the cover-up. And all these disclosures were discussed. Uh, the the uh, witnesses, the eyewitnesses, including the uh, four soldiers who opened fire with their uh, rifles on the on the uh, craft, uh, they described it. Their reports were uh, made public, um, and the, the the soldiers were believed. And that is because the uh, conclusion then, as I mentioned, was that it must have been. Um, some kind of an enemy espionage or sabotage uh, uh, technology of some kind. They immediately leapt to that conclusion. There was never any discussion in the press or amongst the military that, uh, uh, that this was uh, conceivably part of a uh, uh, craft from another world, another dimension, or another planet. Nothing like that at all. It was immediately assumed that it was German. So the, the reports are there. They're all public. One just has to dig them out. Um, it was even during World War II, and this is, the, the, I think, the crucial difference as well. Um, although there were these explosions, numerous explosions at the DuPont plants that took place and that munitions plants were destroyed, uh, like the, like the uh, Tom plant. Uh, the Tom plant, when that was destroyed, was thoroughly destroyed, the... The repercussions uh, in terms of uh, the seismic effects were were so that it registered, the destruction of this munitions plant registered 5.5 on the Richter scale. So it was a, just a huge explosion. Not all of the plants were destroyed, but as I say, many of them were. It was as though there was an attempt by these extraterrestrials to do two things in retrospect. I'm getting into the theoretical or something I promised not to do, but I'm trying to put it in perspective for our listeners. They are trying to do two things. First of all, they were aggressively trying to really prevent um, the spread of the war. They, they did not want to, they wanted to retard our, our uh, technological military progress. 
And also, I believe that it was a warning to us. Because the extraterrestrials, perhaps they could have been more surreptitious about it. They could have destroyed these things without being seen, but they were seen in plain sight. These witnesses, by the way, in many cases, and as time went on, were pro truly professional witnesses. A military man is as professional a witness as you can get, or a policeman. They're, they're quite professional. And when they're making the reports of some things that they were trained to observe and certain points that they're trained to remember, to record, so that they can make these accurate reports. And I think that's what lends ter terrific value uh, to these reports as well. But the big change began. It leapt from World War I, where there were a few, relatively few of these incidents, to World War II, where these incidents increased in a manifold way. And for the first time, there were deaths involved. There were human beings that were killed. Not on a large scale, but nonetheless, lives were lost, both, interestingly enough, on the Allied side and on the Axis side. And this, uh, I, I think, marked uh, a, a higher level of uh, engagement, and uh, aircraft were destroyed. The very first aircraft, uh, al uh, first, um, yes, first aircraft that was destroyed during these conflicts was when um, a B-17 Flying Fortress was attacked um, by these, can be described only as small objects that rained out of the sky that that fell onto the uh, uh, American heavy bomber and set it on fire. And it fell to earth like a comet and all men on, on board were uh, lost their lives. This was, this attack was witnessed by not only um, the uh, fellow um, B-17 pilots in formation, but also by the uh, German pilots as well. The attack came from above the Germans, which who were getting into a position to attack the American formation. But before they could attack the American formation, this one aircraft was destroyed. Um, later in the war, um, a, uh, an imperial Japanese um, fighter planes, uh, two of them were scrambled in, this was very late in the war, this was in early 1945, were scrambled in the Hokkaido area of northern Japan to intercept uh, unknown uh, craft that were making their way towards Japan. And um, they uh, encountered um, the usual description of flying disks, uh, much larger than their own aircraft. These were uh, uh, Japanese Zeros, which at that time were obsolete, but they were used in uh, northern Hokkaido, nonetheless for interceptors. Uh, the Japanese immediately opened fire on these two objects that were flying slow and uh, uh, on their own level. They had no difficulty uh, intercepting them. They fired on them. One of the uh, UFOs appeared to be damaged but was not shot down. The other UFO retaliated and, sh and uh, shot down, uh, uh, disabled and destroyed one of the Japanese aircraft with the loss of life on that aircraft. And then the two uh, um, uh, flying disks uh, disappeared at high speed. And this is a, an early Japanese report. Um, the Japanese had their, had quite a few encounters, although that was the only one in which there was loss of life. But the Japanese had numerous encounters on the ground, civilian observers, and also uh, um, uh, Japanese uh, Imperial Navy Air Force uh, encounters. And the Germans also uh, had sightings. One of the most famous sightings involved Hannah Reich. Hannah Reich was a very well-known uh, female uh, test pilot with the German Luftwaffe or the German Air Force. And when she was testing out the Germans' first rocket plane in 1942, this was the Messerschmitt 163, which had a which was far superior to uh, any aircraft in terms of speed, any aircraft in the world at that time. The thing could fly at speeds of close to uh, 800 miles an hour. Uh, the average uh, uh, top speed of any aircraft at that time was about 400 miles an hour, so it was twice as fast. And during her test flight in 1942, she testified seeing uh, a craft which uh, followed her, Messerschmitt, it was known as the Comet, uh, followed hers up and went past hers at a, a far superior speed. It was as though uh, the UFO was trying to show her that uh, she, she thinks she was flying the fastest thing. Something was much faster even than her thing. There. So she reported on that. 
the Germans reported on these craft uh, numerous times, just the same as the uh, Americans and the British did. They, the Allies referred to them as Foo Fighters, and they naturally chalked them up to German technology. And the Germans did the same thing. Uh, they chalked them up to Allied technology. There was no thought that these were craft from another world or uh, UFOs, nothing like that at all. It was immediately assumed all the way from World War I through uh, World War II. That it was never even thought of as being involved with um, technology from another world. It was always the enemy that was involved in this. It was only after the war when both sides compared notes uh, that they realized that this, these craft were uh, not involved with uh, the German technology or what, something new in advance that the Allies had, that this was somebody else. Interestingly enough, the very first um, authorities during World War II, actually a little before World War II, who began to conclude that these vehicles were not involved with uh, earthly technology were the Italians because there was an Italian crash it's known as the as the Italian Roswell that took place in 1936 and when that crash took place it was outside of Milan this was in more in northern Italy when that crash took place it was thoroughly investigated by the uh, Italian authorities and the Italian authorities involved in some very high profile scientific minds of the time including of all people uh, Marconi the inventor of ra of radio and he was part of a commission which said that this craft that had that had crashed on its own was not brought down by anything there was there were no uh, bodies on board on board nothing like that but nonetheless it was a very unusual craft it was a large uh, disc uh, with no known means of propulsion uh, it's a technology that they had no grasp of and marconi and his colleagues uh, said that this probably comes from another world they were the first ones to to mention that uh, I should mention in the, in the, just briefly in this that this to not to just leave the story there that the craft um, in 1936 had had crashed and it was studied for a year and then in 1937 when Benito Mussolini had an official state visit from Adolf Hitler Mussolini told Hitler about this object and he gave it to the Germans saying that perhaps. Um, saying to Hitler, perhaps your scientists can make uh, more sense of it. Well, Mussolini did not give the wreckage to the Germans, but he allowed the Germans to come in and uh, study it. And the Germans did. They were baffled, but they didn't give up on it, and they tried to back engineer it. Un they were unsuccessful. This led to some of the German um, experiments in trying to duplicate uh, flying saucers. And they they were successful only in making some uh, rather ineffectual replicas, and that is kind of the root story. Uh, and it's it's not a story; the root report uh, for uh, the German involvement in in the UFO phenomena. Yes, there's a, there's a famous image which can be found easily online of um, uh, the Nazis during World War Two constructing uh, what looks like a uh, say conventional flying saucer type craft. Uh, uh -huh. I think the picture's taken in some woodland somewhere. And I don't know if this thing ever got airborne or not, but it was, um, I think that's fed into a lot of the, uh, conspiracy theories, um, about all of this, you know, about German, uh, secret weapons. Cause of course the Nazis were relatively advanced. They were making great forward leaps with weapons technology, not least of which, you know, the, the V2 rockets. But in something you said there, I wanted to pick up most of, these sightings have involved uh, more than one observer because like single people coming forward saying I saw this but very many of them involve one or more people and this helps to kind of corroborate it because you get multiple viewpoints and if people disagree on what they saw then that tells you something and if they agree that also tells you something what I would call mass sightings are very significant they're you know because once you get a certain I suppose as how do you define mass but when you get a certain number of people, you know, 
tens, hundreds, maybe even thousands of people who claim to see the same thing at the same time, you've got a really something, whatever you're dealing with, even if you can't explain it, you've got something very interesting on your hands. And going back to the Second World War is one of the first mass sightings that I ever read about that involved military and civilians. That's the Battle of Los Angeles, which uh, many UFO watchers will know about. And then, of course, there's been a number of these over the decades. You think of the Phoenix Lights, for example, in 1997. So this is just a general point that if you're a skeptic, you can be very dismissive of individual testimony. But as I say, whatever is manifesting here, when you've got at the very least dozens, if not hundreds of people saying, I saw this at this time, you, you, you have to take that seriously in terms of this is something that needs to be looked at. Yes, that's an excellent point, Greg. Um, the Battle of Los Angeles, which took place in early 1942, is really uh, one of the outstanding incidents of all time because you had literally thousands of witnesses, eyewitnesses, both on the ground as civilians, but you also had police, the police reports from that time, which I had access to, which anybody has access to, and military. And it took, these people were witnessing, witnessing these sightings over the course of hours. So you have not only thousands of all kinds of witnesses that are not seeing something whisk through the sky in a matter of seconds. It could be anything. <laughs> this confrontation lasted four hours and it, I, I think it's it's really unprecedented. If there were other mass sightings, even some mass sightings during World War II involving the Navy that involved hundreds of Navy witnesses. The battle involved the USS Hearn in that same year, later that same year, about seven months later, where this UFO was seen not only by the entire crew of the USS Hearn, but was also engaged in other words, there was a firefight involved between this, this well, not a fight. I, I, should, I should say that that is the, the wrong interpretation of it because the object did not fire back. But the object flew over an entire flotilla, which opened fire on this object. It was sighted. Uh, and we have the testimony of surviving gunners, veterans of that engagement. So there, there, when you get multiple sightings by military people, sometimes hundreds, or in the in the case of the USS Hearn, there were hundreds of people that saw this thing and had it in their gun sights and were firing on it to no effect. And then you have the Battle of Los Angeles, which involved literally, who we don't know how many thousands. It could have been tens of thousands of people that saw it, certainly many thousands. Then you have, I think, some really uh, terrific uh, documentary evidence that this was a real phenomenon, that this was not uh, a delusion. Of course, the military uh, and also some of the some of the eyewitnesses, many of the eyewitnesses were newspaper men who were on top of a hotel. This is an interesting thing. There was newspaper men and radio reporters went to the top of a major hotel in Los Angeles. I forgot the name of it, but I have it in the book. And they were witnessing this thing. And they said it was not a balloon. It was not an illusion. It was some kind of a strange cigar shape. Now here, they actually describe it as cigar shape, which is an iconic uh, description of many of these UFOs to the present day. It was a cigar-shaped uh, object. It was kind of like a dirigible, but was not. They had, of course, seen many Zeppelins or dirigibles up to that time. This was not that. It was more blunt at both ends. It was obviously metallic. And uh, what's interesting, the Battle of Los Angeles is uh, precedent-setting for two things. First of all, there's this major sighting in which is described as, as cigar-shaped, and it's also the very first time that the word unidentified flying object was used. And it was coined by a radio reporter who was an eyewitness to this thing, watching it glide over uh, the, uh, the city of Los Angeles, being fired upon by every battery in the um, Los Angeles area was opening up on it. 
the United States was caught in a number of lies at that time. This is the first, and the reason why is because this was the first time they were involved in an official cover-up, so a number of lies. And the first lie was the United States, uh, the United States, uh, uh, the uh, Secretary of War at that time made a um, official statement saying that it was all uh, misidentifications, that uh, people just had war jitters because of Pearl Harbor, and uh, they were just firing on clouds or something like that, and that uh, no aircraft, uh, no American aircraft were scrambled because we knew it was just nothing at all, so we didn't bother about getting any of our fighters airborne. Well, in fact, uh, hundreds at least, again, thousands of witnesses saw American aircraft going after this thing and firing on it. You had civil defense workers who could identify that these were American aircraft. There were squadrons. At least one squadron was scrambled to intercept this thing, open fire on it to no effect again. Um, but all of the records from that time are still classified. How about that? World War II records that are still classified from an, an incident that supposedly didn't take place? That's kind of interesting, but there were numerous witnesses, civil defense witnesses, saying, yes, we, we saw the aircraft going after this. That was common, seeing American aircraft in the, in the air, uh, attacking this object, this cigar-shaped, unidentified flying object, as it was called at that time. But then the official statement was, no, we didn't scramble any planes. But in fact, they did. There were numerous other falsifications at that time, saying, oh, only a few batteries opened up on on it, and when they realized there was nothing there, they didn't fire on it anymore. Well, that's also completely contrary to what really happened. Every single battery was firing on this thing uh, for four hours that they exhausted their ammunition. They had to bring in ammunition from outside the city to keep firing on it. Uh, then after the incident, the... Uh, Again, I forget the gentleman's name. He was the U.S. Navy, Navy uh, uh, secretary at that time, saying that uh, the object was fired upon and that there was more than one, as it turns out. Really interesting <laughs> uh, material that you have to look at. Then uh, I was able to uh, dig up the records on pro uh, professional photographic analysis that was made of the Battle of Los Angeles. Of course, the photographs were splashed all across the Los Angeles Times and major newspapers, and you can see what looks like a standard UFO caught in the uh, beacons of spotlights uh, for the uh, anti-aircraft batteries, and it looks like that's exactly what it is. And, of course, the skeptics have said, no, no, it could have been something else, or it was the uh, photograph has been tampered with since that time. Well, I had photographic analyst reports before me, uh, that were made um, immediately after, uh, at that time, uh, after the Battle of Los Angeles. Uh, the original negatives have been found and analyzed in more recent times, and it does show exactly what it does. It does show a kind of a domed, uh, cigar-shaped object uh, caught in the beams of the spotlights and being surrounded by these explosions. And it's not a standard aircraft of the time. It is, as was characterized then, uh, an unidentified flying object. That concludes part one of our interview. Be sure to tune in next week for part two. If you enjoyed the show, check out the website, which is legalizefreedom.com. That's legalize-freedom.com, where you'll find an archive of programs offering alternative views on a wide range of topics, including politics and economics, energy and environment, culture, spirituality, history, and the nature of reality. Until next time, I'm Greg Moffat, and you've been listening to Legalize Freedom dot com.